the ocean is our life source, it's our lifeblood. My goal is always to share positive stories, stories of hope, stories of solutions. If we invest our time, our energy, our resources into restoring ecosystems like this, we're gonna see results. Roughly 750 species use this habitat in Southern California, and if it's gone, those 750 species are essentially homeless. The key problem we had was too many purple sea urchins due to a loss of predators in the system. So if we don't go in there like we do and intercede and clear out these urchins, they'll just stay put. What we've done is restart this ecological machine so that it can restore its own health. If we just allow the environmentalists to do this because it's their job, we're done. This is everybody's job. We can figure out better and bigger solutions for our planet. Hey there, I'm Michael Stewart. I'm one of the co-founders of a nonprofit called Sustainable Surf and Sea Trees. And I am absolutely psyched to um, be here with some of our um, great friends, uh, pals, collaborators um, for the uh, sea change event. Um, and the name of our session is actually called The Secret Power of the Ocean That No One Told You About. Um, we're going to be exploring um, you know, the role that blue carbon or blue carbon ecosystems um, play in solving climate change and doing a lot more. So um, let me just give a quick intro uh, for people who may not know who everyone is. Um, to my screen right or left, I can't quite figure it out, is uh, Danny Washington. Um, she is a uh, science uh, communicator, a uh, TV personality and host, and a overall rad human. Um, we have next is um, Alex Schultz. Um, he's from uh, Four Ocean. He's one of the co-founders. Um, amazingly cool guy. He's got a great uh, story, and you should ask him about his robotic beach cleaning machine when you can. Um, next up is uh, my partner in crime, uh, co-founder of Sea Trees and Sustainable Surf as well, Kevin Wilden. He's our chief scientist, and right next to him is the amazing, the one, the only Tom Ford, the executive director of the Bay Foundation, which is one of our local nonprofit um, blue carbon ecosystem restoration partners. Okay, everyone feeling good? Ready Great. Go. Sweet, Great. let's do this thing. All right, so again, um, you know, we're talking about the role of blue carbon and, you know, one of the ideas we had for a title of this was, you know, what the F is blue carbon? So. Uh, Kevin, I'm going to kick this off to you because it's really simple um, and I want you to put it in the layman terms. So, you know, what is blue carbon and why is it important for solving climate change? So, listen, solving climate change has been a passion of mine and Michael's uh, for a long time. I'm a geologist. I studied climate change in Antarctica back in the 90s. And I've all of my career has been one way or another figuring out ways to solve the problem. And I can't believe it's getting worse every year. It feels like we've not made enough progress and we've got to reframe the narrative to really cause it, make the solution happen, which I know we can do. And blue carbon is one of the key pieces of that puzzle. It's been left out of the equation quite a while because we're humans, we're based on land, we grow up on land, we think about land all the time. Um, the ocean is kind of outside of our ken, so to speak, even though uh, all life began in the ocean. Now, surfers have a little link to that, that we, that's part of why, as a surfing organization, we actually think that there's a superpower of the ocean to tell this, to solve this problem. Now, the ocean is, is special. It's um, <clears throat> life beyond the ocean. It has 90% of the carbon in the carbon cycle. So if you think about climate change, it's carbon moving around through everything that lives and breathes, through the atmosphere, through the soil, through the ocean, 90% of all of that carbon is in the ocean. And when there's a, an ice age or a warm period, it only changes by about 2%. So if we're gonna think about how to solve climate change, why are we leaving the ocean out of the equation? Um, blue carbon is our ecosystems that actually take CO2 out of the atmosphere and put it into the ocean more effectively than pretty much anything else on earth. Now, what are the powers of the ocean to sequester CO2? We've got mangrove forests, uh, mangroves are trees that live literally on the edge of the sea, and they're five to 10 times more effective at sequestering CO2 than a tropical rainforest. Um, they live right on the edge of the ocean and they take out so much CO2 that, um, that actually feeds the coral reefs and then 
you know, feeds, provides life for all the critters in, that live nearby. Uh, there's coral reefs. Um, coral reefs are also um, very effective at biodiversity hotspots. And there, it turns out when mangroves and corals are together, they actually supercharge each other, believe it or not. There's also coastal watershed. So really, if you think about the connection between life on land and land and on the, in the ocean, rainforests that are on the edge of the sea really are the place where that occurs. And quite often you have mangrove forests and um, coral reefs right on the edge of the coastal watershed. And then finally, we have kelp forests, which are um, basically the redwoods of the sea. And they're quite extraordinary ecosystems that, you know, kelp is one of the fastest growing organisms on the planet. Um, giant kelp can grow up to two feet per day. And it's also um, 700 different species live in, in coastal kelp forests. But it's one of those places where uh, really quite extraordinary amount of CO2 is converted from the atmosphere into um, basically sequestered carbon. We actually have two kelp forests that we support via sea trees uh, in California, right? Um, and um, one is in uh, Monterey Bay. Um, it's a citizen science project um, that we're doing at a place called Tankers Reef. Um, but the one that we're probably the most excited about, the one we're definitely the most excited about, the one that we've both spent time in and uh, underwater um, is uh, the project that we're doing in partnership with the Bay Foundation um, in Los Angeles, um, right off the coast of the Palos Verdes Peninsula. It's probably, it is one of the uh, biggest and most successful kelp forest restoration projects uh, in the world. And we have the guy who's actually in charge uh, of that project with us here. So Tom, we're gonna uh, bring you in. Um, got a quick question for you, Tom. So um, you've got kind of a great backstory, um, but how did you get involved in the science of uh, kelp forest restoration? Um, and can you kind of describe what you're seeing in California's kelp forest right now, and both the bull kelp and the giant kelp forest. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a swing at that, Michael. So uh, I moved out to LA in, in, in 98, um, had a job with UCLA with a small teaching aquarium at the Santa Monica Pier, and I was supposed to feature the kelp forest. Um, but I'm a East Coast guy, New England guy. So, you know, I had never seen a kelp forest, went scuba diving out there, which, you know, what us marine biologists do and swam into this thing day one and went not possible, right? This does not exist on this planet. This is the most <laughs> simply amazing, most beautiful, most diverse thing I've ever seen in my life. And so I was hooked immediately. Um, and then I started studying it because I'm a scientist and, you know, I'm, oh, wow, oh, look about this, look at that. And I found out we were losing them. And so then I was like, well, so how are we fixing them? And the answer was, we're not. And I was like, well, that's not acceptable. Um, we can bring these things back. Um, so that was the crusade that I've been on for, you know, 23 years now of trying to figure out how to put those kelp forests back. Um, Kevin just gave you a great primer on why we need them for climate change. They do a whole bunch of other great stuff too. If you've got a kelp forest in your neighborhood, you're a very lucky person. And if you lose your kelp forest, you're definitely bummed. Um, and there's a lot of things that in your quality of life that just took the nosedive. So um, what's happened in California um, yep. is we've lost our kelp forests over the past sort of hundred plus years. They've been dwindling, dwindling away in Southern California. Um, I call it, you know, it's the radiator leak uh, problem we have. Meanwhile, up in Northern California, they just had a radiator blowout and the kelp forest that was seemingly chugging along just fine. And the bull kelp forest in Northern California, just like pop, went away in the course of a couple of years. Uh, so uh, long story short, we know what causes the decline in these kelp forests. We know enough to know how to put in a fix. That's what we've been doing in LA. It's working great. I'm glad to be sharing that news with everybody um, here with Sea Change and, and beyond. And I'm just stoked to be here with y'all. Amazing. Yeah, we're definitely gonna come back to um, all the amazing things that a kelp forest does for sure. But um, I wanna bring one of our biggest brand partners um, um, into the mix here because um, the way that we see it as a nonprofit organization, businesses have to literally be part of, um, you know, solving these issues, right? Um, not just from their own footprint, but really um, as a way of, 
you know, connecting to their own audience um, and making this a movement instead of, you know, all these little groups just trying to do something small, right? Um, as you've said before, Tom, I think you actually said it on the, um, the big feature piece that came out uh, about the kelp forest on CNN just this last week. You know, you said, this is everyone's job. It's a big lift and we all got to be involved in this. So um, on that note, um, I want to bring in Alex Schultz from uh, Four Ocean. Um, Alex, you live in a blue carbon system too, right? On the East Coast? Yes, sir. Southeast Florida. That's right. Um, a little bit different there. You, you have plenty of mangroves and coral reefs, um, which we also focus on with uh, sea trees. And um, yeah, I just want to talk about how you kind of got started um, in this um, as a uh, surfer who went to Bali um, and saw an issue that you wanted to help, uh, you know, clean up. So um, why don't you give us just a quick um, hit on how you got started um, and why you think that um, having a healthy ocean, you know, is important to Four Ocean as a brand. Of course, of course. Well, first off, Michael, thanks for having me. Really stoked to be a part of the discussion. Uh, you know, Four Ocean was started uh, back in 2017, uh, where my business partner, Andrew, and I realized that we wanted to shift the demand and, and be able to pay local fishermen to collect plastic uh, instead of catching fish. So, you know, on a surf trip to Bali, Indonesia, that's where we witnessed, uh, you know, large amounts of plastic in the ocean and realized if we could just switch that demand and commoditize the plastic and be able to employ local fishermen full time to, to collect plastic out of the ocean instead of catching fish, then we could create a sustainable business model for not only Indonesia, but for the fishermen as well. And that's how it started. So I think that, you know, the ocean is, is rooted in, in our business. And uh, I myself, I grew up on a small island on the west coast of Florida. Um, I'm a licensed captain. I've literally uh, grown up on one of the, in basically the 10,000 islands. So uh, mangrove restoration is near and dear to my heart. I've always been super passionate on that. And when we started the business, we realized that we also wanted to offset uh, our carbon footprint. And that's something that where we started to do our research. So we are really stoked to partner with Sustainable Surf and the Sea Trees program to help with mangrove restoration uh, and, and do everything we can to offset our operations and uh, the, the, the carbon footprint. It, it, it takes running our business, you know, the gas, yep. the boats, the travel, shipping products and doing those things to, to fund our operations. So, uh, you know, it's, it's deep rooted in our business and incredibly, incredibly passionate about it. Yeah, um, that's amazing. You know, it, it, uh, part of this comes down to, uh, you know, storytelling as a brand as well, right? Um, and on the storytelling side of things, um, it's a great segue to um, one of our uh, newest um, ambassadors that we're incredibly happy and proud to have, um, Danny Washington, um, who is a science communicator. The way I tell people what uh, Danny does is um, she helps to tell the story that um, a lot of us in the nonprofit, in the uh, project science world, um, can have a hard time doing sometimes, especially with um, millennials, Gen Z, and um, yeah, just kind of everyone. Um, so, uh, Danny, you know, as a as as someone who looks um, through the lens um, as a uh, as as someone with a science background, you're looking through this lens and saying um, these are critical, important stories. They're not being told in a way that most people connect to them. Um, how did you get started and what was your inspiration like why did you feel that that was necessary and um how do you see you know your role fitting in um with the role of scientists like tom and uh, other people to actually help tell that story absolutely well hi everyone it's an honor to be here and share space with you all um, when I grew up in Miami, I had the dream of becoming a scientist like Tom, going out in the field, collecting data, helping restore ecosystems. That was the dream. But I quickly realized in college that af after that moment, I, I knew that my neighborhood, my community, my even in my family, had no one had any clue as to what was happening in the ocean, which was our blue back backyard. You know, in Miami, people travel all over the world to just come to our beaches, but yet they had no idea what was happening. So with that knowledge, I wanted to make sure and be the bridge and find a way to connect the scientific community and as well and the business community as well together so that we can start having bigger conversations about ocean protection and ocean health. And so over the last decade or so, I've worked in SciComm and, and worked as a television host to create content that is telling positive stories about the world around us and, and how we humans can play a role in making it better. I think there's a lot of bad news out there 
uh, as we get through this pandemic, as we deal with the, the effects of climate change, it's, it's a tough time to be alive. But I also see it as an incredible opportunity for us to turn the tide on this, that we can actually use technology, innovation, and great ideas like what Sea Trees is doing to, to create new waves of change. And I'm just so excited to be a part of that and to serve as someone who can be a catalyst to bring those stories to life and to bring it to audiences that are different, that maybe haven't heard these stories, haven't interacted with the ocean like all of us have on this panel. I want to bring that to, to them, whether it's on their TV screen, their cell phone, or on their laptop. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, you know, um, one of my favorite segments that uh, I saw you do with uh, Facebook, I believe, was, you know, really taking science. It, it was called uh, something like science the sheep um, <laughs> out of it, right? Um, yep, that was it. Yeah, so really taking sort of the like, hey, this is, you know, it's, it was all super well done and amazing. Um, it was new ways to get um, to older ideas, right? Um, and yeah, that's, that's the, um, it's uh, sort of the benefit of, of having a big tent with all of us, different roles and uh, different skills. Um, speaking of different roles and someone who is highly skilled underwater. Um, I want to kick this back to uh, Tom Ford at the Bay Foundation. Can you basically tell us like, what does the restoration work um, in this giant kelp forest in Palos Verdes actually look like? What are you doing to restore and bring these kelp forests back? Yeah, so we're, we're taking a very specific hands-on direct approach to converting an urchin barren back into a kelp forest. What's an um, urchin so, baron? Yeah, so <laughs> thank you. I will get there. Uh, yeah, so uh, urchins uh, are an echinoderm. They're spiny skinned organisms. All of the species of echinoderms that we know of live in the ocean. They're exclusively there. These guys are locals. They are native endemic species to the kelp forest, but we've offset the balance in this kelp forest by removing too many predators. And we've done this over the course of a couple hundred years on most of the world's coastline. And as a result, that top, we call it top-down pressure. Like if you take the wolves out of the forest, the deer become too numerous and they eat everything. We've got the same thing going on in the ocean. And as Danny pointed out, right, like the ocean's got this beautiful mirror for a surface and people don't ever think to look underneath it. Kevin touched on it too. So um, and long story short, we swam and mapped out all the places where these urchin barrens existed that we knew to be kelp forests. And then we sent in our fishermen who can't make a living out of that urchin barren to clear the urchins out. We're smashing them with hammers on the ocean floor um, by the millions. We have smashed over 4.2 million urchins getting the job done off of LA. Like, go ahead, start counting. Two, three, four, five. Wow. It's a big number. Um, but you know, there it is. And it's back. You saw it. I hope you thought it was beautiful. You look, you looked impressed. It was amazing. It was like, as you said, uh, Danny, it was like flying underwater in a cathedral or something, you know? Yeah. Oh, no, it's, it's, it's an it, incredible experience. My first time diving in a kelp forest was off of uh, Casino Point on Catalina Island. And I thought I entered an enchanted forest that I read about as a kid. It was gorgeous. Orange Garibaldi swimming by. I mean, lots of life. And you could just look in every nook and cranny and something was happening. It's just beautiful. Yeah. Hey, Alex. Um, so, oh, oh, yeah, sorry. Um, Alex, uh, I know that you've been swimming through tons of coral reefs. Have you ever been in a kelp forest yet? No, I haven't. I have not been in a kelp forest. I've only been to California uh, for a day or two, so I haven't spent enough time out there, uh, but I'd love to love to be a part of it. Hey, well, um, that's, that's a great segue um, because um, one of the ways that we actually work with 4Ocean as a brand partner, like you said, is um, we're looking at um, the entire carbon footprint that 4Ocean produces, right? So um, transportation, operations, that's gas in the boats, it's packaging, it's shipping, it's um, the materials, the bracelets are actually made out of, um, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, and 4Ocean was actually one of our launch partners for our uh, program, which is called uh, Ocean Positive um, Verified Carbon Neutral Plus Program, right? Um, a lot of words in there, but it's basically a um, pretty simple idea. You know, we're looking at your footprint um, and we're not just going to look at it and say, this should be, you know, carbon negative or carbon neutral or something like that, right? we actually have to make a ocean positive impact on our planet. We basically have to put back more than we've taken out, right? Um, and one of the ways that we actually do that is with, um, is essentially by sourcing um, blue carbon um, credits 
from a variety of different projects. Um, one of those being um, a watershed um, uh, protection, a what's called a uh, ridge to reef. So basically the entire watershed from where the rain starts to where it stops um, and the reefs uh, begin, right? Um, uh, and in, in addition to that, we actually plant mangrove trees and um, your dollars actually go directly into helping to support um, the Palos Verde project. Um, so we have to get you out there. Tom will be your tour guide there. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we're really pumped on is, is bringing, you know, people like you and our brand partners, but also every individual that we can, um, you know, into the projects to where the work is actually happening. We don't want this to be a back of the office thing. So um, that's a long way of sort of, you know, setting up, uh, you know, that kind of question of, <laughs> which, which is kind of focused on you. It's like, how important um, is it as a brand partner, you know, to be helping us to tell those types of stories so that we can bring everyone to these projects, whether it's um, in person, um, like our project in Monterey, or they're virtually through critical storytelling. I, and that's a great call, Michael. I think that's one thing that we as a business have put a lot of effort into, and that is that that storytelling component, being able to educate the, the consumer, uh, our customers, and just a, a big group on social media, uh, what these amazing organizations are doing. So, you know, with you guys, we've partnered not only to offset our, our carbon footprint every year, but we just recently did partner with you guys for our Earth Day uh, bracelet. And with that, yeah, buddy. Thank you. And, and with that, so we're, we're, we're donating a portion of proceeds to you guys. But the big thing is exactly what you noted on it. And, and that's that, that visual storytelling, being able to capture the content and show the world all the amazing things that you guys, as well as the other organizations are doing. Uh, like you said, people that aren't able to get out to California and, and see these things, to be able to show all those amazing things that Danny was talking about. You know, every nook and cranny, all the cool things that the, the kelp forests are doing for the ocean. And that's really what we wanna, wanna continue to do is, is just that visual storytelling to connect people, to understand why. Why should people care about the ocean and why should they be so passionate about all these amazing things that are going on? Man, really well said. Um, I'm going to kick it back to Danny here um, because a lot of us, you know, talk about, oh, we got to do great, you know, storytelling and get people engaged um, and that kind of stuff. And, and Danny, you know, um, you're kind of a pro at that in a different way than um, basically a lot of us, right? So I guess my question to you is um, why is it important to integrate arts and culture into science education um, in a way that grabs people like, what about you know art and music and and culture uh, can be used to basically tell that story in a way that it hasn't? It's absolutely essential, Michael. We need arts and culture to be involved in this type of storytelling because that's what brings people in. We're human beings. We we thrive on stories. We thrive on things that make us unique. Our different lived experiences. That's all a part of our our time here on Earth. And so, as a communicator, it's it's absolutely important for me to make sure that I can tie those things in, tie it into historical facts, things that make your community special. We got to bring that all in. And and I've always believed that art itself is seriously like the tip of the spear when it comes to any type of social change um, throughout history we've seen artists are the first to speak up the first to say something and to create stories that you know um, transcend language you don't have to say anything you could just show someone what why this is important feel why it. Need it and feel it exactly yeah. we, we run on emotion and um, and you know so uh, nine times out of ten emotions will override your logic so <laughs> how can we combine those two things and bring factual information to the table where folks can make logical decisions about our future and that's really what it boils down to and so I'm super passionate about making sure that there's flavor in the way that we tell everyone about why we need to care and that's where it begins yes more flavor what's the to that danny it's um it actually makes it seem more possible when we tell it that way you know because like going back to the superhero frame when you hear about climate change talked about in the media or you know in general conversation it feels like this impossible problem politicians aren't doing anything about it and how the heck are we going to solve it like i got to be a superhero myself to actually do something so I guess I can't do anything. So I don't know. I guess I'll go watch Netflix. You know, that's the frame that it's discussed in. But really, what we need to think about it is that the ocean is the, the real superhero. Right? As we talked about, blue carbon is the way the ocean can take out an amazing amount of CO2 and sequester it permanently in the ocean. Um, all we have to do is figure out what's our role to help the ocean do its job. 
And that's through making things grow in the ocean, blue carbon, protecting and restoring, protecting and restoring blue carbon ecosystems, and finding out ways to basically take our amazing scientific capability and activate that in a way that gets the ocean to do its job. Yeah, man. Uh, I know it's simple, right? Yeah, we can almost <laughs> just stop there, uh, Kevin, but I I'm not going to, um, because I really want to ask Tom, you know, uh, kind of this question that uh, you know we get all the time, right? Which is like, okay, so that's a great you know project that you have in um, you know the heart of uh, LA, right? Um, but can it scale? Like, is it you know, uh, Tom? The question back to you is like, does this one you know first big project um, can it scale? Um, can it be a case study? Can this be replicated? How do we replicate this? across the entire West Coast, right? I mean, it's not just California, it's not just LA, it's from Baja up to Canada, right? So um, can we do it? How does it work? And how does the Palos Verdes project that you've led and created become a case study for helping that happen? Perfect time for that helicopter to fly right over my head too. Um, so uh, yeah, Michael, I'm, I, it's, it's, it's an absolutely appropriate question to ask. Um, and this way I look at it, the, the demand, is there I and mean, that's what we've been talking about the need for this is there yep. and i don't have any doubts um that we can go anywhere we want in the ocean when we've chosen to do so we've done it and if you just look at the expanse of the ocean that fishing fleets have covered um the history and the the, the, the you know the the romance of the of the exploration of the ocean from any number of cultures We've not failed in going anywhere we wanted to go around the ocean. I have no concerns that we're not going to be able to go reef by reef, rock by rock, and make our way all the way around this planet. Uh, evolutionary history, contemporary history tells me that's exactly what we've always done. So, um, you know, we have a lot of partners, Alex, that are part of the 1% for the planet, um, you know, members, right? What else, or maybe what is the role of other um, brands in the 1% membership, whether they're ocean related or focused or not. Um, do you think that all of them uh, you know, have a place um, at this table to do something for the ocean planet, which seems to provide you know, even the air that we need to breathe? <laughs> what do you think? Absolutely, Michael. I think every single business has a seat at the table. I think uh, at the end of the day, we're really moving into a, a different phase where people are leveraging businesses to, to, to have a, a positive impact on the world. And, and we're starting to see more and more brands take part of you know, the 1% for the planet or offsetting their carbon footprint. I mean, businesses as a whole do have an impact on the environment, whether that's the ocean, whether that is uh, uh, the, the carbon they're producing, it's it, no matter what, operating a business has some type of impact. So I think not only can they be a part of this movement and be able to, to you know, have a big impact and support these different organizations that are doing these awesome things, but also, I think it's, it's also about being that role model, right? Trying to, to encourage and inspire other businesses that want to be a part of that and look and say, wow, we didn't really realize how much of an impact our global shipping is having on the environment. Maybe we can look into this or we can do something like that. Um, and I think that that's just really important is, is to, to showcase that and show other brands that you can leverage business as a force for good. Well said, man. I mean, that's that's the um, kind of like Thomas said before. Um, it's something where um, it's a big lift. It's going to take um, all of us. Um, brands are absolutely part of it. Um, and brands, you know, for us are critical to have as our partners in this um, as we go through it, because you guys have, you know, a much bigger audience than typically small nonprofits trying to do conservation work, right? Um, and um, uh, a lot of the people that you guys actually reach out to, specifically at 4Ocean, um, is the younger uh, demographic. So I'm going to throw it, you know, uh, so I think there's some really cool storytelling collaboration things that um, you and Danny actually should be talking about. Um, and uh, with that, um, I'm actually going to toss that back to Danny um, because um, one of the things, you know, that is like absolutely critical, Danny, right? Um, uh, I was just hanging out with a really, with the son of a really dear friend of mine um, who's like, you know, 18, 19. And his biggest, you know, sort of question was, okay, well, 
like I'm super excited and interested in what's happening, but what can I actually do, right? Um, what do you tell, you know, the Gen Z and millennials, that, that next generation that um, is gonna end up with the problem um, if we don't fix this? Um, what do you tell them to, you know, get them involved, to get them stoked? What do you tell them to do? Well, first of all, I start up by telling them, you know, and, and acknowledging their climate anxiety. This is at an all time mm. high. Young yeah. people, Gen Zers, millennials included myself, we have a massive amount of anxiety about our future. And w the reason why so many things are happening because of previous generations, now we're, we're bearing the brunt. So we acknowledge that. And then after that, it's about presenting the solutions. And that's why Blue Carbon presents such a beautiful, um, exciting opportunity for us to, to, again, create the change that we need to see right now and take action now. And these young people are ready. It's just a matter of giving them the tools and the opportunity to get involved. And so programs like Seed Trees and businesses mm -hmm. like Four Ocean can really open that door for young people to get started and, and to find new new ways to lead because we can lean on them. They have the energy, they have the, the youthful ideas, the you know lack of inhibition when it comes to like trying out new things. Yeah, they're and not afraid just, to, to try something, right? Yeah, so yeah. we need to harness that and, and give them the opportunity to see that, no, there is a better future for you and you can be a part of creating it. Man. Um, I'd actually like to leave <laughs> on, uh, you know, that sort of note. Um, you know, it's it's a, yeah, you know, I it's, uh, sometimes I'm at a loss uh, uh, for words, Danny, but I'm not at a loss for action. Um, and just like the UN has basically laid out, the global scientists um, have laid out that, you know, we essentially have the next ten years, right, to turn the ship around. Um, to get right on climate, right? Um, and we have to do essentially two things at the same time. We have to stop putting so much carbon up in the air and we actually have to draw what we've already put up there down, right? We, we have to basically walk and chew gum at the exact same time. Um, and uh, I can see it happening. I can see it with the work that you do, with the interest, with brands like uh, For Ocean and lots of other 1% for the Planet members. Um, with absolutely, you know, amazing um, conservation project partners, the the fins in the ground, the fins in the water, they're actually, um, you know, making all of this work, um, and all of us are, are essentially doing this in service, right, of of helping these ecosystems get back to where they're supposed to be, to put them back in balance. If we can do that, the Earth has the ability to heal itself, um, and you know we can actually end up living on, on a sustainable, just, and equitable planet. There's a plan that we have. We simply have to follow it. Um, and I, am, I, I wake up every day uh, incredibly thankful that I get to work with uh, people like you, Danny, and Alex, you, Tom, you, and Kevin, you too, buddy. So um, maybe we'll wrap on that. Um, I just want to say uh, it's been amazing. I hope the rest of all the sessions are as good as ours. Um, and I really hope to uh, take this um, discussion to the next level and continue it um, in the Q&A. With all the questions we're asking ourselves right now, there's one thing we know for sure. It's time to come together to take collective responsibility. We can all play an active role in creating a more positive future where we take good care of our people and our ocean planet. Sea Trees makes it easy for you to plan to protect coastal ecosystems all around the world. Like mangrove trees, they protect the coastlines from storms, increase biodiversity in the ocean, and soak up five times more carbon from the air than a rainforest. Each one of us can take direct actions to make our seas a healthier place.